Okay, I think we're ready to go. My name's Louise Walker. I'm a senior project manager at Syria. Thank you for joining us for our Suds and Highways Are We Nearly There Yet webinar. Before I finish, I'd like to thank our SUSDRAIN partners and supporters for their support in our ongoing programme of activities. I'll now hand over to our chair for the day, Jessica Jeffries. Jessica is product manager at Innovise, looking after their drainage and design products. Over 15 years, Jessica has been actively involved in several industry bodies and has a keen interest in promoting suds as part of surface water management solutions. Over to you, Jessica. Thank you, Louise, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on suds and highways. So before we start, what brings us together today? Well, very few water bodies in England are classed as good under the EU Water Framework Directive. And according to the Environment Agency, agriculture and rural land management, the water industry and urban and transport pressures account for many of the water quality problems. With so much of our towns and cities made up of roads and highways, there is growing evidence linking polluted watercourses to runoff from highways. There is also growing evidence around the impact of intense rainfall on our impermeable road network that can shed polluted runoff. With climate change and urbanisation, these problems are only likely to get worse. So today we'll hear from industry leading experts about how integrating suds into our developments, roads and highways provides exciting opportunities to better manage the risks associated with runoff. High quality suds along highways can also contribute to improvements in biodiversity, amenity, air quality and our general quality of life. Despite these benefits, the integration of suds with highways is yet to become common practice. So this free SUSTRAIN webinar, predominantly presented by those working in council highways departments, will outline the opportunities to manage surface water better from and along our highways. I'm delighted to be joined today by four esteemed speakers, Joe Bradley, Alan Myers, Liz Burnley and Jamie Cucadia. Jamie, you'll notice, has also received a nomination in the Sustrain Awards, which hopefully lots of people will be joining um, for next week. So before we get started, we're going to have a quick poll. We're interested to gauge what field of work you're in. That poll should pop up in just a second. There we go. So what is your main role in delivering SUDS? Do you fall into one of our designer categories, consultant or landscape architect? Do you fall into an approver category? Um, and we're interested to see um, the, the split here potentially between the different local authority levels, a water utility, a developer, or consider yourself in the other category. We'll leave that open just for another minute or two. Hopefully we've got a few people filled that in now and then we can share the results with you. And interesting there to see that most of the people joining today fall into our designer category in one form or another. Welcome landscape architects, um, just a few of you here today and then most of the rest in the approver category, although a big portion not falling into any of these. So hopefully we've got some champions in some of the other um, fields of work there among us today, which is great. Thank you for that interesting result. So let's begin with our first presentation by Joe Bradley from Stormwater Shepherds. Joe's going to give us an overview of the challenge of surface water runoff from highways. I'm sure many of you will know Joe. She's worked in on many aspects of water management during her 30 year career in the UK, including working in a clean water laboratory as a trade effluent officer and has overseen drought plan development 
but her passion lies in pollution prevention and control. And she was lead author on some of the Environment Agency's widely respected and applied pollution prevention guidance notes. More recently, her, ten her attention has been on pollution from urban surfaces and roads. Jo managed a joint Environment Agency and Highways Agency project to prioritise highway outfalls in terms of their pollution risk, working with design engineers to create effective treatment schemes for some of those priority outfall outfalls. Jo firmly believes that if they are designed properly, SUDs can be applied on every UK development. Jo was delighted to join Stormwater Shepherds in September 2020, and she is intent on driving pollution control forward in the UK faster than it has gone before so that we can achieve zero pollution in her lifetime and protect rivers and oceans and all the creatures that live within them. Thank you very much for that, Jo. Over to you. Thanks, Jess. I'm sorry, that was such a long bio. I'll, uh, I'll work on, I'll work on that. It's because I'm, really, I'm really old. Oh, it's because you're, you've achieved so much, Jo. <laughs> um, brilliant. Thank you, Jess. So um, I'm just going to give a few introductory slides because I wanted to leave as much time as possible for our practitioners who know far more than I will ever know. But I wanted to just talk a little bit about why road runoff is a problem. Um, and I've done this a couple of times this week for various people and I get and the reason I bang on about this and you keep seeing me popping up all over the place is because it's really important so road runoff contains suspended solids toxic metals polyaromatic hydrocarbons and also microplastics and, and they're poisonous you know we talk a lot about sewage and raw sewage and agricultural runoff and I know that they're awful and I know that they're the primary reason why rivers fail but these pollutants uh, in road runoff, things like benzoapyrene, uh, copper, zinc, <coughs> they are directly poisonous to the things that live in the rivers, but actually some of them are poisonous to humans as well. And so with this increased focus on river swimming, um, and if any of you are river swimmers, I think it's important that we start to think about the risks of swimming downstream of road outfalls, especially from trunk roads and motorways. But actually my passion is about protecting aquatic wildlife. I believe that rivers are for river, river living organisms not really for humans and, and so I, my focus is on on the wildlife. Um, I like river swimming um, but I think we need to do it in the right place and do it with respect for the other things that live there. So those poisons are in the runoff, they're in there far higher than raw sewage. I can show you data with PAH levels higher than raw sewage, uh, copper and zinc and so we need to do something about it. So what impact does it have? So Jess has already said that not a single English river passes the water framework directive for chemical compliance. So she's, we talked about WFT compliance. Some of those chemical failures are associated with polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And I believe that some of those chemical failures are associated with road runoff, although there's very little evidence. Uh, data is sparse. Um, it's difficult to get data delivered or collected because it's expensive to, to analyze for PAHs. And so we, we need more data, but we mustn't wait for the data. We know this is a problem. We know it causes pollution. And so we need to crack on and fix it whilst we're gathering more data. The thing to remember is that at the point of discharge, all discharges of road runoff are polluting and going back to the old environmental permitting regulations and the Water Resources Act before that, any discharge of poisonous, nox noxious or polluting matter is a criminal offence. And so we, we get tied up in the Water Framework Directive and compliance data and dilution and, and stuff, but actually, strictly, every discharge of polluting matter is a criminal offence and we should remember that. And then, as I mentioned, PAH is a horrible. It's interesting that I've listed they're carcinogenic, mutagenic, bioaccumulative, and they affect the reproductive success of invertebrates. And actually, I was doing some more reading yesterday for something else that talks about benzoapyrene having the ability to pass through the placenta into the unborn baby. And again, that takes me back to the risks of river swimming. And I think we need to do a whole lot more research. So how can we fix it? I'm not Mrs. Doom and Gloom. Uh, I'm Mrs. Happy and Cheerful. And I am really confident that we can fix this. Uh, and you've certainly come to the right place to work out how to fix this because Alan, Liz and Jamie are going to give us fantastic examples of retrofit suds, new build suds and how to 
deal with road runoff. But I just wanted to say before we go to those three speakers, please remember that if you're dealing with motorways and trunk roads, it's a slightly different design uh, detail. So uh, Liz and Jamie and Alan will primarily talk about local authority roads, where your traffic volumes might be um, anything from sort of 3,000 up to 30,000 vehicles a day. As soon as you start talking about motorways and trunk roads with 50, 60, 100, 150,000 vehicles a day, it's a whole different ball game. And this image is really good. Um, I, I like this image because this is a filter train with an incorporated uh, crash barrier uh, on the A14 that was recently constructed. And I, I think things like this give us examples of what we can do. Get the solids out, get 50% of the solids out if you can. That will give you really good cost-effective pollution prevention um, because a lot of the pollutants are in those solids. Uh, Susan, I noticed somebody's put in the chat about sound distortion. I hope that's not me, but please let me know if I need to do something. Um, are these options truly suds? I get shouted at sometimes because they don't look like suds. So when I'm talking about that filter drain I just showed you in the previous slide, uh, there's no vegetation, there's no amenity, but do we really want to de deliver amenity in the middle of a, of a motorway? No, we don't. So sometimes we have to be realistic about suds and the, the, the bits of the suds the four pillars of suds that we want to deliver. On a, on a trunk road motorway and a busy road, busy urban road, we, it's important that we get the water off the carriageway. It's import, important that we try and attenuate flows to reduce flood risk. And it is essential that we deliver pollution prevention, but we may not, we won't deliver amenity or it's unlikely that we will deliver amenity and we can't always deliver biodiversity. Don't get me wrong, some of the motorway embankments in this country are some of the best habitats I ever see. I love that dense scrub and the shrubs and the small trees and the under, understory and there's no human access. I love that, but we can't always deliver that. But sometimes the most sustainable thing to do is to capture the water, treat the water and then put it back into the water environment so that that water environment can thrive. And that's sometimes the most sustainable thing to do. Whatever you build, you must maintain it. How many photographs of dodgy gully pots have we all got? Um, you know, anything, gully pots, combined curb drainage, pipes, filter drains, basins, swales, wetlands, you name it, it needs maintaining. Um, but you, it's people talk about, oh, suds are difficult to maintain, suds are a pain to maintain. It simply isn't true. I was out yesterday uh, and I encountered a young man streaming some swales and he was happy as a, a as a, a pig in muck he was thoroughly enjoying what he was doing and it was a, a nice day and it was easy it's easy work um it's resource intensive sometimes but it can be done and it's not there's no reason to believe it's more expensive than conventional pipe to drainage maintenance and then um susan and and uh uh, Louise said, can you do a case study when you do slides? And I'm not going to do a positive, cheerful case study because we're about to see loads of those from the other speakers. I'm going to do an uncase study or an anti-case study because this is a pond that treats uh, trunk road motorway runoff in the south of England. It's not big enough, uh, or at least I don't think it's big enough. Somebody might argue with me. It's not been maintained for probably 15 years. Um, it takes really, really polluted runoff and there's no treatment device upstream of that pond. So that pond has become a sort of a pit of doom. It's just polluted and it's disingenuous of us to say that that's suds because it's not. We're just creating a, a soup of pollutants uh, surrounded by vegetation and we need to be honest about what we're doing and not pretend that that's, that's good suds. And so what needs to happen? We need to shout about these case studies and we're about to do that with, with Liz, Jamie and Alan. We need to all say how brilliant these, these devices can be. You look at Llanethley and Cardiff and Sheffield and Enfield and some of these fantastic examples of what SUDS can do, not just for pollution prevention and water quantity, but for the community as well. So let's shout about it, all of us. Uh, don't let people tell us that it's too expensive and it can't be done because it can. Um, we need some changes to DMRB. Uh, we need more uh, highways in the SUDS manual and I'm, I'm uh, trying to encourage people to do that. Uh, we need to know what the design treatment flow rate is and what the residence time. So look at that pond and think how, how big should that pond really have been? What should my residence time have been and what is my treatment flow rate? We need to get much more grown up about asking those questions. Lots more filter drains because I love them. And then big beautiful ponds and wetlands when we can. So less of this. This is a, a highway outfall off the M53 on the Wirral in Lancashire, um, on the Merseyside, I'm sorry. 
it's a it's a pipe discharge straight into the river down that down that concrete channel no treatment no attenuation no nothing and we need to stop building those and more of these this is a small example so this is a detention basin at gloucester services on the m5 uh, the treats the runoff from that car park you can see but isn't that lovely isn't that just the loveliest thing you've ever seen i think that's it thank you very much Thank you, Joe, for that. You've given me another reason to go to Gloucester Services, if not just to have one of their amazing sausage rolls. I can now look oh, at the subs at the same time. <laughs> and the ginger, ginger crunch slices. <laughs> um, so that's given us a really great introduction. Thank you, Joe. If you've got any questions for Joe, please use the question and answer box. If you've got any questions for anyone throughout, please use that question and answer box that will be easier for us to field the questions than the chat um, feel free to ask them we'll raise any questions for joe in the discussion at the end but we want to get on to these amazing case studies that joe has referred to so we're now going to hear from alan myers senior drainage engineer at lancashire county council alan will talk about lancashire's approach to delivering suds in highways and a Brief introduction, Alan has 40 years experience within the sewerage, flood risk and drainage sector within local authorities, designing, building and maintaining sewer drainage and flood risk assets. So over to Alan to hear about Lancashire. I hope you can hear me all right now. Good. Uh, well, good morning to everybody and thank you, Jessica, for the, uh, that introduction. And uh, also thank you to Joe for the, uh, the very succinct uh, coverage of the uh, problem of pollution in road drainage. I'd like to explore with you a few, um, a few of the drivers uh, that we've been using SUDS. But before we go into that, I'd just like to explain where we are at Lancashire County Council in terms of integrating SUDS into our road design process. And it's really a little bit pragmatic at the moment, but we are trying different things. And we have a number of teams that uh, design and construct SUDS elements um, associated with highways. And some of them uh, are trying things that I haven't tried or might, you know, the team that I'm involved in hasn't tried. And we try things that they haven't. Uh, some of the younger ones are quite adventurous in their, uh, their outlook. And uh, several of them have been on um, Syria training courses as well, which has given them a really good insight into the, um, the benefits and the practice of uh, providing suds for highway drainage. So looking at the, the drivers for using suds, um, the case study that I'll lead on today um, was mainly driven by planning constraints, I'll be honest. You know, we were forced to do it because we had a, um, a planning application that we had to uh, comply with that was also subject of a public inquiry for the uh, compulsory purchase orders that we needed for the road. I hope this makes sense to um, a good number of you this morning. And I'm not going to go into too much detail on each slide because time is of the essence this morning and Joe's given me a, such a good start that probably most of the, the slides um, with the, with, um, without the pictures on <laughs> are going to be a little bit uh, uh, superfluous. But uh, what, what I would say is that most of our highway authorities are, have a role as the lead local flood, flood authority as well. So they have a responsibility to manage flood risk, but they also have a, a responsibility to lead by example. And that's where we are. We want to lead by example. Now we're finding our way. We're not there yet, but we're finding our way. Um, and also, of course, we have regulations that guide us in our, our designs and our targets for what we should uh, accomplish out of that. My background is mainly in design, construction and maintenance. I'm, I'm a practical person. I like to build things which are good, which serve the purpose that they are designed to do and to be easily maintainable. 
So in the process, when I, I start looking at a, a site, I like to think about the three, three words there, and that's topography, hydrology and geology. And also combine that with the geography of the area. Your, your understanding of the area that you're dealing with will help to frame your master plan for that site or for that area. You need to identify your target flow rates. Think about you know, what um, standards you've got to meet and look at the locations. But more than that, look at the opportunities that you've got presented by um, presented by a, a site. You know, it's like a blank canvas on some sites. You've got a, um, a palette that you can work with within SUDS. And don't forget that the design will be an iterative, iterative process where you will try things out in, on the design stage and you'll change things as they go through. Don't be afraid to change things and to get new ideas on um, different features. Okay, um, so we've lots of guidance for SUDS at the moment, and some of it is fairly easy to use, and some of it, it I have to be honest, hasn't been in the past. Now, Joe did mention about integrating um, SUDS, uh, sorry, SUDS more into the highway design codes, but also about bringing highway drainage design into the SUDS manual in a greater extent. Now, I'll be honest, I haven't read the whole of the current SUDS manual. It's a thousand pages long and we dip in and out of it, but I would encourage you to get an understanding of uh, the SUDS manual, which is now currently C, uh, Syria um, document C753. Particularly on the introductions, it gives you a really good overview of the SUDS process and the targets and aspirations that you can use to guide your designs. I'll, I'll spend a little bit of time on geocellular structures because we've done, we've carried out a number of construction projects that involve geocellular structures. There are some good examples and there are some pitfalls with geocellular structures. Now, one, one of the pitfalls seems to be that some of the manufacturers of units, particularly the, um, you know, the, the open cell type structures have not until recently been thinking about C737. So the testing that's required for those units to, um, to enable a design to be done to C737 is, is not as well developed. So currently we are using both of those targets in the design of our geocellular structures to allow a greater range of units to be used. That's not to say that we don't use C737 as the um, the process of, uh, of the design, but some of the detail is still, we still use C680. But we are coming up to date and things are improving on that front. The revised design manual for roads and bridges documents are far easier to use than the old HAHD series. Those familiar with those, um, particularly LA119, which is the um, highway drainage in the water environment. I know Joe might disagree with me a little bit on this, but it's a big improvement on what we had previously. It may not be there yet, but it's a big improvement. In Lancashire County Council, in common with many of the um, lead local flood authorities and highway authorities across the country, we have our own specification for SUDS, which deals with how we design SUDs, the sort of features that we will adopt and the sort of features that we're not considering adopting at this stage. An example of that would be porous asphalt, which at the moment we are not accepting for use within the adopted highway. We will, however, consider permeable block paving within shared use spaces and 
um, cul-de-sacs. So there is some scope there for using um, a permeable block paving within the uh, highway. Obviously, if it's away from the adopted highway, then we would consider each proposal on its own merits. We currently use uh, micro drainage for analysis of um, our drainage systems. Okay, three principles, as far as I can see, be behind SUD's design. And I had three words in my mind, the purpose for which you're designing, how you communicate that message to the full design team, our maintenance team, construction team, and also that we bear in mind the maintenance aspects of the features that we're designing as we start our design process. So that we're scoping out and um, laying out our, pl our plans in a well-structured and well-ordered manner. Okay, so where are the features going to be cited? Do you need to, the question I ask is, what area of land do we need to construct those? How are we going to obtain that? And how is it going to be maintained going on from there? One of the key things that we found is that you actually need to talk to each other because there are a number of different disciplines that feed into this. Uh, we've also we've already dis discussed, obviously, that we've got a few landscape architects with us, which is great. They are vital to the look of the features and to the practical uh, issues of what planting to use and how that's laid out. To your technical engineers, we need to work out what our ground conditions are going to be. Now in Lancashire, we have about 80% of our area, by my estimation, that is not suitable for infiltration type um, suds features, leaving a very small amount of possibilities for infiltration. On some of our um, uh, developer schemes that uh, I've, I've been involved in, we have used um, infiltration um, systems comprising either standard soakaways, sometimes infiltration basins, and also geocellular infiltration units. Right, so this is quite dry. This isn't quite dry. This is where I start to get excited about the real world of uh, our drainage environment. This is in a local park in an upland sandstone area. Now, this was constructed well over 100 years ago by voluntary labour. Now, that might surprise us. 100 years ago plus, look at that lovely feature. There are some slight disadvantages to this feature, and I'm not going to criticise it because I think it's such a good example, and I wanted to use it particularly in relation to sediment management, which is one of my um, passions, is how we deal with sediments as they arise from the road uh, environment. Obviously, Joe's talked about how that... Um, environment is affected by the pollutants within road drainage. But just to give you a picture of um, what's happening here, you can see roughly halfway up on the right hand side of that picture, there's what looks like a little white strip. That's actually a ramp into the base of that pond. The base of the pond seems to be a fairly hard surface, possibly concreted across. Now, like I say, I'm not criticising it because it was built a long time ago and it serves a fantastic purpose. So when I went down earlier this year, that is roughly how much siltation they've got out over a period of two to three years, by my estimation. There's something like 200 cubic metres of debris there. And, you know, that's what three or four hundred tons to dispose of. 
it's actually quite good fill. It actually compacts really well. I've done a compaction test on it and passing. Okay, let's bring us on to our, our main case study this morning. Right, brought and bypass, 27,000 vehicles per day. Pre-COVID, hopefully a lot less now. During the, the lockdown, it went down to about uh, eight to 9,000 vehicles per day. Right, four main catchments along two kilometers of road. We've got loads of suds elements in different ways. Okay, Joe talked about upstream pollution getting into that um, pond next to the, uh, the motorway that she was talking about. When we were designing this scheme in about 2014, 15, Joe came to our office and we discussed the options for uh, pollutant load reduction. The HORAT assessment, that's the Highways Agency Water Risk Assessment Tool, that the consultants had carried out for the project had indicated that uh, the most of the outfalls that we were proposing would fail on sediment. So bearing that in mind, we started looking at the best way to deal with that sediment. And we've chosen uh, vortex separators as a pre-treatment system for all four of those catchments within this uh, road project. We also have flow controls, vortex flow controls, hydro brakes, whatever you want to call them, down at the, um, the lower end of the project. Okay, so let's go to our first photograph and you can see this. Now this wasn't necessarily quite how it was designed, but this is how it ended up after construction. And you can see there that visually, it just looks like a bit of open water, not doing very much at all. You can see from the date on the photograph that this was three years ago. Now, within our SUDS policies, we're looking at side slopes of one in four or less, which this complies with. So access is quite good into the base of the uh, pond there for maintenance access. The hydro brake, unfortunately, is right at the very far end of the basin. There's nothing we could have done about that. It had to be there. So it's just a fact of life. Having said that, visually, it does, it's not very attractive. Three years on, that is what it looks like, which is quite a transformation now. And I'm very pleased with the, uh, the look of that. It's really, you know, nature has really made a difference in that area. You know, the vegetation is helping to um, remove pollutants from the water. There is a good amount of retention time. It's around about a couple of hectares catchment that leads into that. So it is a reasonable size and a good area. Okay. Maintenance issues. Spot the separator. Now you might not be able to see that there. I won't ask for a poll on how many of you can see it. That's where it is. It's well hidden. So when our maintenance teams in a few years time come to uh, visit that site, there will be little trace of it. So we're going to have to do some remedial work in that area to try and remove some of the uh, immediate vegetation and uh, give a, a clear marking as to where it is. Move on to the more traditional methods of attenuating flows. And I'm just mindful of the time here. So I won't go into too much detail, but again, there were dynamic separators uh, planned for the top end of this geocellular unit. We've got a dry weather flow pipe running through the center of the geocellular structure. So there's another similar uh, width of geocellular to go in on the right hand side of the photograph. The flow control is just on the left of um, where the fencing is. 
at the front of, you, of, the, of the picture. And there's a, uh, a main river, well, I say it's a main river, it's, it's main river classification running along the left-hand side where the tree line is. This was sited basically within the floodplain of the uh, river. So again, we looked at the structural calculations, we looked at the um, that very, very critically, and we also looked very critically at how much siltation would actually get into what is mainly uh, a closed structure. There's access points put in so that we can actually jet out these uh, geocellular units. They're an open cell structure so that there are continuous passages through the structure. Um, that's what it looks like, well hidden. I just include that one just to show the uh, the wrapping that goes around the geocellular tanks so that um, the impermeable membrane around the uh, the inner wrap doesn't get punctured. Right, and so what did we learn from that project? Yes, you know, we need to think about maintenance and how maintenance is carried out. Now, this is a later um, pond within a, a private development. It takes the adopted highway drainage from an existing public highway. And it, it, it's far more natural already in its shape. You know, it's got a much, uh, much less rigid form. It's close to housing. As this develops in uh, vegetation, then the view from the road will improve the view from the upper rooms in the um, adjacent housing will uh, really improve. Now, I'll try to give you just a, a very brief overview of the sort of things that we're doing and, and that, but we've got lots, lots of other examples of where we're trying different things to try and um, reduce the pollutant loads coming into the, um, the river network. So at that point, I think I'm gonna have to um, just finish what I'm saying and I'll just pass it open to do some, sorry, just before I finish, yeah. Think about those three principles, the purpose of what you're designing, understanding and commu communicating the aims and principles of what you've designed to the, the um, fellow designers, the construction team, and the maintenance teams and really get to grips with what you're expecting out of this and consider even at the start how maintenance is provided and funded in some cases. Okay, so any questions please? Thanks Alan, um, we have had a few questions coming in. Um, one that is specifically for you is that uh, why are you not accepting permeable asphalt and only permeable block paving? A good question and I can't give you a, a good answer on that one that's part of our uh, policy. Okay. <laughs> it, was just, it was just an example of some of the the things that have gone into our, uh, our policy which you know it, it uh, I think we had done some research on the background to uh, porous asphalt and there were some um, issues raised by our materials uh, team at the time. Okay, fair enough. Another one on maintenance um, from John Nicol. We are concerned with the long-term maintenance costs and disruption of SUDS features. Designs that have been presented to us require reconstruction within seven to 10 years. We have found that an oversized attenuation pipe works better and can be maintained. The local authority take all the risk if it doesn't work. What is your view? Um, I'm, I'm from a very traditional uh, drainage background, so I can see where the, uh, the question is coming from on that, uh, that point. I think I would like to leave that because I think the costing and the maintenance side of it is dealt with a little bit further on in 
um, some of the other presenters' slides. So I'd, I'd like to just miss that for the time being. If, the, if it's still unanswered by the end of the session, then we'll deal with it in Q&A if that's all right. Yep, that's absolutely fine. So just a reminder for everyone that we are having a, a discussion, a further Q&A session at the very end with all the panellists. So please keep your questions coming. If you can keep them coming in on the q and I think most people have now moved from the chat to the Q&A. And remember, you can click the thumbs up to like other attendees' questions so that we can identify which are the most popular. OK, thanks again, Alan. Um, next, we will hear from Liz Burnley. Liz has worked for Lincolnshire County Council in the development management team for 26 years. She is the county manager for development and will talk about delivering suds in highways in Lincolnshire. So over to you, Liz. I can't hear you yet, Liz. She did say she was having some connection difficulties, didn't she? So she did. Yeah, I'm just I've lost my video screen to see whether her video is on. I don't know if anyone else has got the video. Showing video or or unmuted. Oh, oh, we've got video of Liz. <laughs> oh, we've got sound. Hooray. I lost connection just as I was about to start, but just got it back again. So fingers crossed we'll be okay. Oh, it's away. Thanks, Liz. Okay, thank you, everybody. So there are a number of negative impacts associated with the conventional drainage systems. These include, include incre increased flood risk, limited capacity, pollution, erosion to watercourses, drought damage to trees and shrubs, particularly in urban areas, and wildlife can often become trapped and killed by conventional urban drainage systems. There are four critical objectives that SUD seek to meet. Quantity, managing flows and volumes to match the rainfall characteristics before development in order to prevent, prevent flooding. Quality, preventing and treating pollution to ensure that clean water is available as soon as possible to provide amenity and biodiversity benefits. Amenity, enhancing, enhancing people's quality of life through integrated design that provides useful, attractive, multifunctional spaces. And biodiversity, maximising the potential for wildlife through design and management of suds. I manage the DM team in Lincolnshire. It's a team of 22 staff that are multidisciplined. So as well as being statutory consultees in the highway, in the planning process, when with regards to highways, flood risk and drainage, we also approved the section 38s and 278s, which is really helpful in getting that coordinated response and making sure that what we say in planning, we then follow through at section 38 stage. The images on the screen are of Witham St Hughes. This was one of the first developments in Lincolnshire that incorporated SUDs. Section 38 approval for this scheme was issued in 2006. And the scheme includes a network of roadside swales that discharge into a number of dry basins and ponds before discharging into an existing riparian drain on the perimeter of the site. And on the images here, you can see the swale um, behind the fence there is one of the dry basins and also behind the trees. So as you can see, it's a really nice environment. When this first came in for approval, I think it's fair to say that at the time we had serious reservations about adopting the swales. We knew nothing about swales at the time. And I think all of us were absolutely convinced that the system was going to fail. Um, so as a result of that, we did ask for an extended maintenance period. So the normal 12 months was extended to five years. And we also requested a commuted sum to cover the cost of installing a positive pipe system should the swales fail. And I think we were expecting them to. Um, every time it rained, the development management team used to jump in their cars and drive down to the site to monitor the performance, always fearing the worst, always expecting the swales to be full. Um, but actually, still to this day, I'm not aware of there ever being any standing water in the swales. 
these photos were taken three weeks ago. And as you can see, even with very minimal maintenance, they still look really good. Um, there have been lessons learned from this exercise. Um, at the start, surface water was discharged into the swales by curb offlets. Um, the offlets, of course, concentrated flows, which we now know should be avoided. And they also have to be jetted to keep them free from obstructions. So the lessons learned that um, now the swales that we adopt are usually flush with the carriageway and allow surface water to freely flow into them. And this has obviously reduced maintenance costs. Suds should ideally be integrated into the fabric of the development using the available landscape spaces, as well as the construction profile of buildings. This approach provides more interesting surroundings, cost benefits and simplified future maintenance. So good SUDS principles are surface water is managed at surface and source where possible. Public space is used and integrated within the drainage system. The photo on the bottom left is an example of a multifunctional space that can bring significant community benefits by adopting its function to the weather. So in dry conditions, as you can see there, it serves as an attractive open space. When there's periods of heavy rainfall, it can also act as an area to store surface water in the event of an exceedance. Design cost needs to be effective to operate and maintain over the design life of the development in order to reduce the risk of drainage systems not functioning. And the design of the drainage system should also take into account the likely impacts of climate change and changes of the, in the impermeable area over the design life of the development. Lincolnshire County Council, along with 15 other authorities, were on the project team which created the Sustainable Drainage Design and Evaluation Guide, which was published in 2018. This guide promotes the idea of integrating suds into the fabric of the development using the available landscape spaces, as well as the construction profile of buildings to create more interesting surroundings, cost benefits and securing future maintenance. Lincolnshire County Council have also put together their own development roads and sustainable drainage design approach, which provides information about what we'll adopt and what the design parameters are. We also have our own development road and sustainable drainage specification construction guidance, which sets out the required standards in more detail. So this is really for construction purposes. All of these documents are available on the Lincolnshire County Council website, should you wish to look at them. In 2017, Lincolnshire County Council worked with Mervyn Pettifor to develop a planning toolkit which is included in the back of the design approach document, so well worth a look at. Um, its purpose for us was to upskill staff who had only previously been used to providing statutory sponsors relating to highways. And it also provided guidance and training to our stakeholders as to what information was to be required to provide to be provided under the new non-statutory substandards that were set out in 2015. And it's a really useful document, as you can see from the slide there, um, it will tell you what's required at various stages and then you can click on the links and it will give you more detail as to what needs to be included. As a two-tier authority, Lincolnshire County Council believes that the most effective flood risk and drainage outcomes arise from early engagement with the Highways Authority and Lead Local Flood Authority and Risk Management Authorities. Topographical surveys, GI reporting, existing landscaping and pre-development runoff rates allow us to best design a system that mimics the natural environment and prevents an increase in flood risk to or from the development. The way that we in Lincolnshire ensure this happens is by encouraging our stakeholders to seek pre-application advice and encourage them to attend multi-agency group meetings, which are hosted and chaired by the local planning authority. So who attends the meeting? The planning authority, as I've said before, they chair the meetings and arrange them. The lead local flood authority, the environment agency, the water and sewerage company, the internal drainage boards, developers and their consultants and agents and landscape architects. When designing suds, consideration needs to be given to the site and its natural hydrology, historical drainage elements and where these are present, the ecology of the site and its surroundings, 
landscape and character of the locality and natural flow routes. We need to know what the drainage proposals are. So how is the developer proposing to drain the site? What are the ground conditions like? What are the ground conditions like and does the site infiltrate? Where are the nearest outfall points and is there capacity to connect? Is there enough storage on site? And are suds being provided and if not, why? It's really important that extensive ground investigation is carried out that's fit for purpose. Make sure that infiltration tests are carried out at finish levels, not at the existing ground level. We have had examples where developers in our area have been caught out because they've done groundwater level tests um, and infiltration tests at ground level when actually they've raised or lowered the finish, the finish level, which has meant that where they thought they would get a layer of infiltration, they're actually hitting clay. So that's really critical. Is there a risk of flooding to and from third party land? And if so, they need to prove how this will be mitigated. A SUDS maintenance schedule must be provided for all assets on the site. Who will be in adopting the various elements of the drainage system? The meetings provide the lead local flood authority with the opportunity to give advice as to what we're prepared to adopt and to allow for a coordinated drainage solution to be found. For example, LCC may adopt the swales, but the water authority might adopt the under drain below it, which is draining the properties. We found that developers really welcome the opportunity to meet with all the stakeholders at the same time in order to agree the best possible outcome. It results in best, better design, allows a specialist to suggest alternative, better solutions, and reduces cost and time scales, and really does help streamline the planning process. In the past, drainage was usually considered at the end of the design process with a pipe system solution superimposed onto the site layout. Sustainable drainage, however, must be integrated into the site design. It should reflect the topography, geology and drainage character characteristics. A while ago, I attended a workshop about manual for streets, which was mainly attended by planners with just a few representatives from highways. And I was quite shocked that there was an overwhelming view amongst the planners that when they agree a manual for streets layout at planning, developers hit a brick wall when a section 38 submission is made, as hi the highways authority won't consider what they think is a substandard road layout. So a layout that includes trees or different materials to what they consider to be the norm. I just wonder if you've had similar experiences. Historically, developments were drained by positive or pipe systems. Surface water was collected in roadside gullies and carried by a pipe system to the outfall point. Such systems have limited capacity. Surface water is carried to one area and discharged, so it can lead to surface water flooding. The system is often buried. So it's difficult to detect leads, leaks or blockages until the systems exceeded or floods. It was also difficult to achieve the storage required and we ended up with huge pipes under the road. On the other hand, sustainable urban drainage systems deal with surface water at surface and source. So the slide to the left shows a photo of a swale which replaces a historic carrier pipe. Surface water flows into the swale over land and is carried to the discharge point. As you can see, although this is a drainage feature, it's dry and will normally only hold water in a heavy rainfall event. The second photo shows permeable paving. Permeable paving allows surface water to permeate through the carriageway construction straight into the permeable ground below it or into a carrier pipe. This allows for much greater storage volumes than the historic pipe systems. LCC as Highway and Lead Local Flood Authority will adopt swales, permeable paving, and dry basins that are draining the public highway. We'll also accept connections from private drives or domestic properties into the highway system if they're being drained sustainably. So where we may have a permeable paved domestic driveway out falling into a permeable paved carriageway, we would accept that connection, but a one-off charge of £525 per dwelling will be required. In some cases, LCC may adopt a roadside swale that's draining the highway from overland flows, with the water authority maintaining an under drain that's accepting the private pipe connections. Where drainage assets are not being maintained by either the water authority or the highway lead local flood authority, a management company will be required. 
Lincolnshire County Council charges commuted sums for the future maintenance of non-standard materials or assets that are not included within the development road specification. So for example, things like ornamental street lighting columns, we would charge a commuted sum. However, we do consider that suds are standard and due to the fact that we're actually actively promoting them, we don't charge commuted sums for them. And that's meant that now over 90% of the developments that we adopt are drained by suds. Construction management plans should now be submitted for all major planning applications or difficult sites, such as those in city centre locations. This is of particular importance when SUDs are proposed to ensure that their functionality isn't compromised during the construction process. Methods of sediment control, erosion control, protection from overrun, temporary drainage, including outfalls, and a programme for constructing and stabilising the SUDs assets should be included. Combined construction management plans and SUDs method statements are required as part of all Section 38 submissions, and we don't provide technical approval until this document's been submitted and checked. Construction management plans are of particular importance where permeable paving is to be used. The construction of permeable paving means that until the bitumen layer is punctured, there's no drainage on site. And as you can see there, there's a puddle of standing water. So consideration really needs to be given to how the site will be drained during the construction process, as it's essential that the permeable layer isn't punctured until most of the site is constructed to ensure that it doesn't become contaminated and blocked by construction wood and dirt, otherwise it would need to be removed. It's also important that swales are kept clean during the construction phase to ensure that their functionality is not compromised. The slide to the left shows a swell where the base has been protected with a geotextile and granular material to catch any dirt and contaminate, contamination, which will then be lifted once the majority of the construction works have been completed and the site's considered to be clean. The base of the swell will then be turfed. The swell to the right is a swell that hasn't been protected. And as you can see, the, the turf has virtually worn away and the base is severely clogged up with dirt. This will all need to be removed and the swell will need to be reconstructed. And this is something we've picked up as a lessons learned exercise. So we'll now include a specification for the swell to the left in our development road spec. In 2018, LCC carried out a review of 11 existing SUD sites across the country that were constructed between April 2015 and December 2018. For five of the sites, the site SUDS locations quality, quantity, performance, and initial indicative whole life costs relating to highway and related SUDS asset maintenance and replacement were all considered. And it was interesting to note that the SUDS across all the five sites were functioning really well, despite the fact that they'd received virtually no maintenance since being built. Initial outcomes have shown that when comparing the whole life costs of highway SUD systems alongside traditional highway drainage systems, and by taking an appropriate risk-based approach to maintenance and asset replacement, they can provide a greater benefit at lower cost. And they did show to be around 27% cheaper than traditional highway drainage construction methods. Obviously, this is based on a small sample of sites. Um, so it will be necessary for us to monitor the costs over the next few years. In Lincolnshire, we're still developing a programme for the maintenance of SUDs and features such as swales are cut three times a year as part of the highway flail cut and any weeds present in block paved footways or carriageways are treated during our two weed treatment cycles. Pipes are currently only cleaned in response to concerns such as standing water and are not currently on a routine programme, but this is something that we'll be looking at over the forthcoming year. Sweeping of permeable pavements, pavements is also something that we'll be building into our maintenance programme. Sweeping in Lincolnshire is currently a district council function, so we'll need a coordinated approach. So let's look at some common myths surrounding suds. You can't deliver suds on sloping sites. Yes, you can. This is a site in Lincoln, which was constructed on a steep slope site. It was adopted three years ago, and it's a site of 13 dwellings. The carriageway is constructed in non-infiltrating blocks and surface water flows overland to the grass filter strip into the conveyance whale and out falls into a surface water sewer. Gabion baskets control the flows along the length of the swale. 
SUDS can't be delivered on sites that don't infiltrate. Again, yes, they can. This is a development in Lincoln, which was constructed on a site where infiltration is poor. It was adopted over two years ago and is a site of 52 dwellings. The carriageway is constructed in, in non-infiltrating blocks and tarmac. Surface water flows overland across the grass filter strip into the conveyance swale and outfalls into a water course that's maintained by the Internal Drainage Board. Suds are more expensive to construct and maintain than traditional drainage systems. Well, as we previously demonstrated, LCC have found that suds are cheaper to construct and maintain than traditional pipe systems when taking a risk-based approach to their maintenance. You can't use suds on sites with a high groundwater table. If a high groundwater table has been detected, then a sud solution needs to be found that's shallow and will avoid infiltration. Suds components such as swales and permeable paving that normally rely on infiltration may still be suitable if used in, conju in conjunction with an impermeable liner. LCC has chosen not to adopt lined permeable pavements due to the maintenance liability of them, but we do, however, adopt lined swales. And that's another image of Witham St. Hughes that you can see there. So who can adopt and maintain SUDs? The government options are service management companies, water and sewerage companies, local authorities and private individuals. LCC will adopt SUDs if they're integrated into the highway and these can include the discharge of roof water. And as we've discussed before, when this is the case, we do charge a service charge. As lead local flood authority, it's essential that we know who's responsible for maintaining all parts of the surface water drainage system, even those that we're not adopting. So for de developments where we're adopting the estate roofs, it's important that if a flood event does occur in the locality, we're able to determine who's responsible for maintaining assets that might be failing. So a SUDS maintenance schedule must be provided for all assets on the site. So just to recap, the responsibility for ensuring that SUDs are designed and implemented to a satisfactory standard lies with the local planning authority. It's essential that planners, lead local flood authority, highway authority, members, both district and county councillors, developers, consultants and water and sewerage companies are on board in order to deliver a sense of place that we're all aiming to achieve. It's probably fair to say that we were all sceptical when we first became involved in SUDs and many still are. So it's really important that we work with those that are still sceptical to win them over. As an authority, Lincolnshire County Council have offered and provided training sessions to our local planning authorities, their members, developers, as well as our own highway maintenance teams. And we would really strongly recommend that you work closely with your internal and external partners. Take them out on site and show them problems that you've encountered with traditional pipe systems. I'm sure that you've all got examples in your areas where positive systems have flooded or have become a maintenance liability or are just not very attractive to look at in terms of creating a sense of place. Then show them some good sub sites. There are plenty of them around, not just in the local areas, but nationwide. Don't be afraid to show them what you think has worked well in your areas, as well as what you think hasn't worked so well, and how this has been addressed later on on larger sites, later sites. Um, in LCC, we're not saying we've got studs right. There's still lots of things we're learning, lots of things we're developing. At the moment, we're looking at the wilding of um, our verges and swales. So it's an ever evolving process. Don't be afraid to Sorry, we found that talking through our thought processes with our maintenance teams, members and other internal and external partners, backed with sound evidence and examples, has played a big part in the way we're now able to function. If you feel that the process isn't working in your areas, either as a developer, a consultant or a highway authority, be prepared to put in the effort and commitment to build confidence and instill a collaborative working approach. And if you do want any more advice about what we've done, the lessons we've learned, of course, contact us and we'll be happy to help. OK, thank you very much. Thank you for that, Liz. Great to see all those examples there. The questions are 
flooding in now. Um, don't worry if we're not answering them straight away. There will be a lot of time for discussion and picking up some of that Q&A at the end. Um, but there's, there's a bit of interest in the questions, Liz, if you don't mind me asking one now, around the flush curbs. Um, one question in, rela in relation to um, the footway or cycleway often being located next to the carriageway um, and how do you get the flow into those um, features to minimise sort of maintenance costs and then slightly related to that have you seen any increase in vehicle overrun or pedestrian collisions as a result of those flush curbs? Yeah. Where possible, we would request that the footways or cycleways move to the other side of the swale so that you've got carriageway, swale, footway, cycleway, or that a shared surface is provided, which again really helps to create that sense of place. Um, so that is the way we'd get around the swale issue. Um, in terms of collisions, no, we, we're not aware of any collisions that have occurred from making the carriageway flush. But again, I think it's important that you create the sense of place. You know, don't just build a road that looks very roady rather than streety and then put a swale next to it. it, it you need to look at the whole design and the whole area. Um, and in terms of overrun, we've had, we've kind of evolved with overrun. At the start of the process, we were asking for developers to put in fences. We very quickly backtracked on that because of the maintenance liability and they're pretty ugly to look at. Um, and on the whole, we don't find that overrun is a problem. And I think, again, because we, um, in my team, as well as being the approvers of the Section 38 submission, we also deal with the planning um, statutory consultations. We're able to make sure that the design's right so that we make sure that we're not encouraging overrun later on in the design process. Thanks for that. Hopefully that's answered those questions. Really helpful to hear the practical application of it, I think. Um, and another quick one before we move on, there's just a request that those documents you mentioned, if we can share the links to those, um, hopefully we can sort that out after the uh, after the presentation. Okay, thanks again, Liz. Um, I'll invite you back for the discussion after our final speaker. So finally, we will hear from Jamie Kukadia. Jamie's an engineer in the watercourses team at London Borough of Enfield. And Jamie's going to talk about retrofitting suds in highways in Enfield. Thank you. Um, let me try and sort now. That's OK. <laughs> Jamie, but while you're getting that set up, that's fine, because I just realised I've missed half of your bio off. Jamie is also part of the innovative watercourses team at Enfield Council, whose key focus is on reducing flood risk and improving the river environment. Jamie's project manage rain garden and wetland projects across the borough and works collaboratively with highway and traffic colleagues to retrofit rain gardens. And as we've said, Jamie is also one of the shortlisted Sustrain Suds Champion 2021 nominees. So over to you, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, well, I'll introduce you to Enfield. So Enfield is the northernmost borough of London, and it's got a wide network of watercourses, um, and it's actually got a really big suite of lots of different land uses. So if you can see my cursor, we've kind of got some green belt farmland um, to the west. Um, we've got these huge, like urbanized, typical London areas. Um, and then we've also got lots of industrial areas as well um, along the Lee Valley. So all of the watercourses and rivers are flowing from west to east. And there's obviously quite a lot of flood risk associated with these watercourses. And there's even more surface water flood risk associated with the a highly urbanised environment. Um, so you can kind of see the figures that we're getting is that we've got like 35,000 properties of risk of um, surface water flooding in Enfield alone. And that's kind of without the climate change allowances. So I'm going to focus on a 
very um, typical catchment, um, urbanised catchment called the Moorbrook CDA. So the Moorbrook is a lost river. It's an underground river. It was kind of culverted in the 60s, um, 50s and 60s um, to kind of make way for development. And there's obviously quite a lot of flood risk associated in that catchment. Um, and the Moorbrook was part of the, um, the Moorbrook studio was part of a um, wider project called the London Street Suds Pilot. And it was, it aimed to kind of look at and evaluate the benefits of multiple distributed suds across the whole catchment and also um, look at all the benefits or uh, the additional benefits of suds measures. So when I talk about suds measures in this particular presentation, I'm, I'm talking about rain gardens. Um, so, of course, the Strudic Suds pilot key findings included that the dispersed suds implemented a large scale across the whole catchment, so not necessarily at the areas that are of high risk of flooding, but kind of distributed across the whole catchment in areas that might not necessarily be at risk of flooding, um, generated the best um, flood risk benefit. And actually, what's more compelling about this, um, this project was that there was really, really large benefits of traffic calming and health benefits of these rain gardens were actually outweighed some of the flood risk benefits. Um, and that's really key in um, the traditional kind of sense of delivering suds measures and rain gardens as part of um, flood risk um, projects. Actually, they should be really well integrated in the healthy streets agenda, traffic calming, and actually should also be recognised for their mental health benefits and, and promotion of active travel. Um, so we've managed to deliver quite a lot of rain gardens within Enfield, um, and that's excluding all the rain gardens and other suds measures that we've adopted from developers. We've done about 150, um, give or take, probably um, give. <laughs> But we've managed to successfully integrate them into kind of traffic calming schemes, um, lots of public realm improvement schemes, and and also what's really kind of kickstarted it was the the cycle infrastructure. So we had a, a mini Holland project or a cycle Enfield project where we um, put in lots of cycle lanes and cycle infrastructure, and these rain gardens were really great. Um, a great alternative to putting loads of gullies in and also really really good at kind of separating the vehicular realm and the and the, the footway and the cyclist realm which i think liz mentioned before in her presentation so going back to the the moorbrook catchment um we um because of of, of the flood risk associated in that catchment and also the highly urban nature of the area I mean, there was quite a lot of pollution going into that water course and it would then outfall into the Pims Park Lake and obviously people would be very upset seeing um, the lake being very highly polluted. So we delivered two wetland schemes, one at First Farm which is a park and one at Pims Park which is also a park but we noticed through modelling that there was still quite a lot of residual surface water flood risk in the catchment and that the distribution of lots of suds measures in the catchment would be greatly beneficial in reducing that residual surface water flood risk and also that residual pollution that you know keeps accumulating throughout the catchment. Um, so we certainly wanted to put lots of suds measures in that catchment but at the same time our traffic and transport engineers were looking at ways to implement quiet way cycle routes so cycle routes that would connect into the larger cycle route infrastructure around Enfield. And to do that, you do have to make quite a lot of changes to the road. So you have to try and create kind of low traffic neighbourhoods or quieter traffic neighbourhoods, better crossing points, better kind of junctions for cyclists. And we kind of put our heads together and created um, the Hazelbury Neighbourhood Improvement Scheme, um, which was trying to use rain gardens quite innovatively to create these low traffic neighbourhoods, create better crossing points. Um, so the yellow um, dotted lines that you see are the cycle routes and the green dotted line is actually the roots of the underground river, which was going to be lined with rain gardens. So it's kind of like a, a marker to show where 
where the river was um, underground. And these particular numbers relate to key locations where quite a lot of interventions um, were put in place. So an example of one of those key locations is um, a, a, li a little parade of shops. Um, it's quite usual in residential areas. We've got kind of a parade of local shops. Um, and obviously this is a very usual, very typical 70s, 60s service road. Now, um, this service road is probably not meant um, for the, this day and age. It's not very designed for accommodating um, what we require now, because certainly the service road cannot um, get any of these delivery vehicles down it at all. Um, there isn't kind of an in and out or an exit and an entrance to the service road either. So there'll be you know, cars coming in at all sorts of places. There'll be people double parking. There'll be people being angry that they can't park and delivery vehicles blocking the road and everyone beeping each other. And what's also interesting about this particular site is that there's no crossing points. So it's not very pedestrian friendly at all. In fact, it's incredibly vehicle centric, so much so that local people that would just nip into the shops, in and out of the shops, would be driving to their local store instead of walking or cycling. And on the other side of the service road, we've got a very, very wide road, which is just coming off the A10. And it's about 9.5 metres wide, which is almost the same width as a dual carriageway. And, and certainly people would be using it as a dual carriageway in a rat run and driving very manically down this road, this residential road. So there was kind of quite a lot of issues to deal with. Um, so <laughs> we really thought of um, incredible ways of where we can integrate rain gardens and to um, address some of the issues with this particular road. So what we've done is we've extended the footway out to create more space for pedestrians. We've rearranged the parking layout and use the diamond shaped rain gardens um, to separate these parking spaces. For the wide road, we've built out into the road using these rain gardens, and these also have also facilitated crossing points. Um, and we've also put in some loading bays, so there's actually places where uh, delivery vehicles can load and unload. Um, so this is what we presented to the local people and um, this is what it looks like right now um, I say look right now this is very early in the morning but actually this cafe during the day has lots of tables out and about within the footway and there's people kind of milling about and, and using that space which is really amazing to see that people are actually walking to the shops people are using um, using this area in a, in a completely different way and uh yeah we've rain gardens made that all happen and here's um here's just a picture of the, one of the build outs and the facilitated crossing points just so you can don't need to imagine that so at the other end of that particular road there was a school so while you know cars were like driving very manically to the very end of the road there was um, a school entrance for the very little younger kids um, for a primary school. And this is what the uh, what it looked like before uh, we put our interventions in. So again, there weren't any crossing points. Um, it was quite cha chaotic. Um, people would be driving their kids to school. And of course, there is a huge issue with air quality and there's an obesity crisis. So. Uh, our traffic engineers were really, really trying to get people to actively travel to school, especially when primary schools have got a very small catchment area. It's kind of most people live in the nearby streets and they're still driving their kids to school, which is crazy. Um, so how have we use rain gardens here? We kind of use rain gardens again as build outs and um, to create a chicane effect. We're trying to get rid of parking so people aren't parking outside the gate and there's actually a little bit more space for uh, for people to cross and people to have better sight liners, lines as well. So um, this is what it looked like 
not post construction, I would say, because um, some of the rain gardens hadn't been planted at that point. But it's, you know, it's a lot better um, now. And obviously, this is what it looks like in the peak of COVID. <laughs> Um, but that's a kind of an idea of what the rain gardens look like and um, how it's improved that particular part. Now, um, I'll try and run through some of the um, obstacles that or uh, that keep cropping up when people are designing and delivering rain gardens. One one thing that people are very worried about are buried services, and of course they are everywhere in an urban environment. Um, so the key thing is to make sure your the services are in the gravel layer of a rain garden. So the way a rain garden is built up, I'm not sure if anybody knows, is um, is through a gravel layer at the bottom, a sandy topsoil layer, and what we call freeboard. So that's kind of the the distance between your ground level or whatever whatever area your rain garden is receiving or, or draining. And um, just making sure that the buried services are in the gravel layer and it can easily be drained. That's one fundamental thing. If there's quite a lot of services, you can change your rain garden design on site. Um, so the one on your left, diagram your, on your left, means that you just stop digging. Don't, have, don't worry about digging around the services. You can make your rain garden really, really shallow at that end and then dig dig deeper when it's where it's less busy and that way your rain garden doesn't really lose capacity and if the services are incredibly shallow you could even try and bring up your gravel layer all the way to the surface and then change the change where you put your uh, your planted layer as it were but more often than not we dig around services because I think I guess it, it's probably because we we build out into the road and there's less services and it's less busy but we don't tend to change our rain garden and um, build up too much um, but all of this is kind of summarized in the UDL designing rain gardens guide which I encourage everyone to have a look at some amazing gravy authors I don't know who they might be um, and one one thing that's a huge gripe <laughs> um, is is often it's the lack of experience of suds design and construction. That should not be a reason for people to not try and, and create suds. It's just to always make sure about some fundamental things with rain gardens. And one fundamental thing with rain gardens is you have to make sure that water can actually get into the rain garden. Um, for some reason, we've got a really big habit, especially landscape scaping contractors. They've got a habit of mounding planted areas, and unfortunately, that does mean that water cannot get into the rain garden. So, what we tend to say is that the free board that you provide, um, i.e., the distance between your ground level and the finish level of the rain garden, should be about 200 millimeters. So that's kind of like a curb width and that will allow the water to kind of easily get into that rain garden um, and we're not kind of playing with 50 millimeters or 100 millimeters that could easily go wrong um, if we're talking about inlets uh, try and make the inlet as big as possible i would say um, i think at the moment we're saying that 300 millimeters for an inlet is probably the minimum and 300 millimetres is just because you can get a really nice little road sweeper to sweep out any silts that accumulate at the end. Um, but obviously, if you can do a flush curb, then you won't really have that issue at all. Um, and yeah, we, we see this quite a lot um, with developers, certainly, is they, uh, they have gullies upstream of a rain garden or unnecessary gullies surrounding a rain garden. Um, the whole point of having a rain garden is, is firstly, is or on a day-to-day -day basis is to improve water quality. And the only way you're gonna do that is to make sure that the first flush or your first bit of rainfall is gonna actually enter that rain garden first. So 
unnecessarily gullies upstream of a rain garden is a big no-no. You can actually um, relocate some of existing gullies within the rain garden. So actually it's, it's receiving um, runoff first and then you can have an overflow back into the system. So those are some of the gripes. Um, and then here's a couple of top tips for maintenance and vegetation management. Um, so again, I would suggest that you want to create your free board as deep as possible. So that can take into account siltation over time um, and you don't have to necessarily desilt a rain garden very often because it distributes the silts over a larger area than a gully. But if you make it as deep as possible, then it takes into account accumulation. And um, always remember that rain gardens are very free draining. I think a lot of a lot of people think that, oh, we'll stick in water loving plants in rain gardens because it's it's a rain garden. But actually, most of the time, um, these uh, these rain gardens don't have water in them. So you, drought tolerant species are always a good go to. Um, and remember that drought tolerant species still need a bit of establishment. So what we have is like a two year maintenance ma maintenance regime where these plants are kind of watered quite often. They're um, they're de weeded. And if you actually if you plant um, if you plant plant densely, you kind of get less weeds and in the rain garden as well and the big go-to is to make sure that your ground maintenance um, team are involved in the process they know what's happening and actually we tend to let them choose the plants because they maintain the rain garden a lot better if they they feel that they've been involved in that process so those are uh, some of my top tips um, and then I'll kind of leave you with hopefully a little bit of inspiration that it's not too hard to integrate rain gardens within the highway and, um, you know, we're not looking for one hit wonders, we're, we're trying to get a really good rollout, um, not only across the borough, not only across London, but across the country. So yeah, thank you. Thanks for that, Jamie. Certainly some very inspiring rain gardens there very beautiful ones as well lots of questions came in throughout about the inlets and the detail around that I think you actually have gone into that in quite a lot of good detail at the end but having mentioned services there were a few questions around that in terms of if they're in that gravel layer um, what happens to the vegetation if there's um, maintenance needs to be done to those services um, and and have you sort of brought that into your street works reinstatement specification absolutely yeah so um, we kind of had a not a run-in but an issue with um, one of our uh, utility companies digging up one of the rain gardens and and obviously they are supposed to be reinstated, stating like for like, but obviously at that point, the utility company hadn't really come across any rain gardens before and and mounded it up and put a different type of topsoil in. So what we've done now is we've got a GIS layer of all of the rain gardens in the borough. And that is with our permit team and our permit team uh, highlight this as a special engineering difficulty. So our fir their first point of call is avoid digging up this rain garden. And if they can't avoid digging up that rain garden, what they do is we give them the specification for that rain garden. If they feel that they can't actually do it, we ask for um, a contribution so we can actually remediate it. And we usually remediate it with our contractors. So actually, the other thing that I should really say is um, once you once you kind of get in the role of of delivering rain gardens and you've got a contractor that knows what they're doing they they're the best kind of ones to use and they'll know all about rain gardens they'll know all about what the topsoil should be and what the gravel should be and what depth they should be at um so yeah that's if that answers that question hopefully yeah i think so um 
yeah that's great uh, I'd like to ask the other presenters to join us again for the discussion thanks thanks for that Jamie it, it was a really great presentation um, so if I can ask Joe, Alan and Liz to put your webcams back on and join us we have had so many questions I'm not sure we'll get through them all um, but I will I will do my best. The, the first one I wanted to ask sort of slightly more um, generically was it looks to me in the questions we've we've still got quite a few questions coming through about how do you address the issues of around land take of suds and um, additional maintenance, which I think has been partly covered in the presentations. But I, I've seen the, the multiple benefits and, and working these things into non-drainage schemes seems to be one of the themes. I wonder if each of the um, council representatives can talk a little bit to that more in terms of, you know, that myth busting again around land take and maintenance of suds. Um, Jamie, do you want to start that one? Yeah, so I think so most of the suds that we do deliver are within the highway and um, conveniently I do sit in highway services. So when we're talking about land take, we're really talking about the land that we own and that we work on. But I think it's a lot more complicated when you kind of get out further out of London and uh, there's lots of different kind of land owners and land ownerships. Um, but yeah, I think we kind of I wouldn't say we've got free reign of, <laughs> of our highway land, but um, I think it's yeah, it's all it's all about considering lots of different things. So you know what the land is used for at the moment, what we want the land to be used for. You know, how can we accommodate lots of different users? And I think that's the key thing is certainly when we're doing it in the highway is what are the key users? Who are who are the people that use it the most? Usually vehicles um, and how can we kind of change that because and that's a really big drive in Enfield because we've actually declared a climate emergency so we're kind of really trying to understand how to shift the nature of our roads and make it more resilient and obviously yeah <laughs> thanks for that Jamie Alan do you want to speak to that at all I think my experience with land take is more focused around the uh, private development sites and obviously if it's integrated well into the original master plan of the of the site as we've uh, a number of people have said you know if we consider it early on then you can create the spaces which are beneficial to the people pr principally in that area so yeah there's there is a, a cost to that land but you know the, the developers understand that but the you know the value of the properties particularly can be increased by use of these open spaces that we've got which are then multifunctional yeah great and what about you like liz how how do you think you've addressed that i think it's really important not to look at each component in isolation so if there's a requirement for a footway cycleway a carriageway a suds feature an open space don't look at them all in isolation and actually combine them. So you can claw some space back by um, creating a shared surface space. So you lose the footway and cycleway element, the open space, as, as we've shown before, you know, have that as a suds feature. So an exceedance flow area. Um, so if you do that, you do claw back a lot of space. And I think, you know, it's not true. Suds don't take up a lot of room. You just need good design. Thanks. Yeah, really important. Um, Joe, anything to add on that one? You know what I'm going to say, Jess? I'm going to say filter drains are the super, <laughs> super, <laughs> super solution. Super solution. I like filter drains. They're skinny and they just run along the entire length of the road, taking up a very small land take at the edge of the carriageway rather than then trying to buy, find a big piece of land for, for a pond or a basin. So for some installations, some, some sites, filter drains are excellent. I like them. <laughs> Good stuff. Thanks for that, everyone. Just a reminder, because we've had a couple of questions coming in about logistics, there will be a recording made available after um, and 
questions that we don't get to answer, we will try and follow up and answer after. Okay, moving on to a couple around existing sort of documentation and whether we need to do some more work there. I know, Joe, you've answered in the text, but perhaps you could um, say that verbally around what your thoughts are on the design manual for bridges and roads, is it? Roads and bridges. <laughs> roads and bridges. Um, and any updates you feel are needed there in order to to sort of bring pollution up the agenda from a highways point of view? Yeah, we can combine a couple of questions actually, because Mark Goodger had asked about whether or not the single index approach was adequate. Um, yeah. And I'd, I'd answered that to say, I think for low and medium risk surfaces, the simple index approach in the SUDS manual is, is adequate on its own for water quality um, consideration. But as soon as you move into a waste transfer station or a, a paper mill or a road or a motorway, then the simple index approach on its own isn't adequate and you need to do a site specific risk assessment. And then somebody had asked about, um, I think it was Rebecca had asked about what, what I wanted to do to DMRB. There's just a few bits. I mean, it's a, it's a good document, don't get me wrong. And HD45, which was the original water quality element was very good indeed, but there's a couple of bits missing. We desperately need more information on treatment flow rates for design. We need more information on the volume of ponds for treatment. So loads of stuff about the volume of ponds for um, attenuation and, and hydraulics, but not enough on treatment. And there's not enough recognition of pollution from polyaromatic hydrocarbons in DMRB. And that needs addressing. A couple of questions as well about the relationship between that and the manual for streets. Um, and I think for the sorts of things we've been talking about this morning with, with Jamie, Alan and Liz, the manual for streets is, a, is another very important document. And it does mention SUDS, it's got some SUDS in there. But some of the case studies and, and um, practical um, examples that this morning's speakers have been talking about would be fabulous to feed into Manual for Streets um, because that's about the public domain. Um, I can't remember what they call it, but it's about public space. And it would be excellent to put some of Jamie's examples in there, for example. Sorry, I'm going to mute because somebody's just opened a chainsaw, just started a chainsaw. <laughs> that's all right. Thanks for covering off several questions there around documentation um, we've got a few questions come in as well on how the different tiers of local authorities are working together so um, I'll just repeat that question how closely do local authority highways technical and maintenance teams liaise with LLFA flood risk and SUDS teams or is it separate silos so again perhaps each of the local authority um, speakers can tell us about their experience. Alan, can I come to you first, please? Yeah, no problem there. Um, we're breaking out of our silos, <laughs> is the simple answer, we're trying to, um, with um, collaborative working and things like that. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a lengthy process to actually um, get team integration within our own organisation and then to try and integrate with um, uh, external partners particularly it, it it's happening but it's you know we could be um communicating better i think in in certain ways so yeah there's, there's still a work in progress for us thanks liz for us it's really easy because we're all one team <laughs> So, so it's really easy. Um, people that approve the Section 38 are involved in the planning process. We hold lots of meetings where we'll discuss developments coming forward. So really simple. Only the maintenance team are a separate team to us. Everything else is covered under the development management umbrella. And Jamie, is it the same for you? It's similar, yeah. So we, we sit in highway services, but of course there's lots of other teams that do deliver SUDS or can deliver SUDS. So there's like the, the regeneration team that will look at SUDS through Enfield's developments and then, um, you know, the planning authority and the planning teams and, and the traffic teams. Um, so we've done something similar to what Liz has done, which was host lots of seminars, you know, make sure that we're talking to the right people, um, and, you know, making sure that we're all kind of talking to each other and speaking about it, especially because there's kind of new documents, like there's a new local plan, there's a, you know, climate emergency and 
um, a, a blue green strategy that's recently been published in Enfield. So it's kind of a, a huge steer towards um, better quality green space and understanding our, our blue assets as well a lot better. Breaking down the silos in all three cases then, which is which is good, or at least on that path. Um, okay, something a little bit different. A question here: What are your thoughts on some on the sometimes contentious subject of fencing off devices which have standing water? Anyone want to go first? Me, there, me. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> this is something I've been talking a lot about recently, and do you know what? I I absolutely agree that in a lot of situations you can afford not to fence it off, and you can put a life ring, and it's up then to the local people to take responsibility for their own health and safety. But um, I was looking at some legacy studs recently that have become beautiful habitats, and they're already fenced to some extent because they belong to a water company. And do you know what? I, I um I've been reading loads of stuff on Twitter and LinkedIn about ground nesting birds and bird disturbance by people and dogs particularly. And I thought, you know what? Let's just fence these off, um, because not for safety, but actually to allow a really valuable habitat to develop that people can't get to, because we've got to get a better balance between amenity for people and habitats for wildlife and actually in some respects fencing off that pond so that one alan showed with the rather attractive fence around it i'd, I'd sometimes fence these off because if you've got ground nesting birds you know you've got ducks in the rushes nesting or you've got coots or or if you're lucky to have more exotic birds than that people walking by with dogs are just going to disturb those nesting birds um and we can't get dog walkers to keep their dogs on a lead um I know that I know that from my own experience of my dog. So it's actually, I'm go for fences. Yay, fences, says Joe. <laughs> Anyone else want to chip in? I think I, I think I, that's I, a sorry. Sorry, carry on. Um, I think that's a really interesting thing that you've just said there, Joe, because it's not something we've considered as, as an authority, and we're always quite against fences at LCC because of the maintenance issues that they introduce. But yeah, that's that's an interesting point, Jo. Um, I think we've become very risk averse, haven't we? So we think that we need to fence everything to make it safe. And actually we don't we don't fence off our carriageways and and they're much more dangerous than an area of standing water. You know, if a child decides it's going to run in front of a refuse truck, you don't get a lot of notice. But if they fall into a small puddle of water, you stand a good chance of being able to pull them out. Um, so, yeah, mixed feelings about them. Joe's made really good points there. So I think that's something that we need to take note of in the future when we are considering ponds and wet features. Jamie, I didn't see much water in the rain gardens you showed, but well, yeah, we do have quite a few wetland schemes um, which have standing water in them. But obviously, we kind of make them as shallow as possible, make sure that you know the the slides and the slopes are, are quite shallow, so people can get out rather than specifically get in. So I think what we tend to do is not fence anything um or steer away from fencing as much as possible i think the only places where we've actually put fencing in is is where we've had to really make some steep slopes um to avoid trees or avoid services or, or something like that so um the general principle is no fencing okay thanks for that i'll uh, just come in very quickly on that if you don't mind um yeah the, the, the risk averse um argument is quite strong and it depends on the organisation that you're talking to as to what level of risk they're prepared to take. For example, we've done, we've carried out um, a, a culvert opening within primary school and so that we've now got running water running through uh, primary school, but we did fence it off. Um, and it has led to, as Joe pointed out, quite a, a habitat forming there. Um, the example that was in my photograph um, is slightly different because it's, although it's taking highway drain, drainage from the existing adopted highway, because it's within the development site, the developer's uh, management company is going to take on the landscape maintenance of that area. So it actually remains in their ownership. So the decision to fence it wasn't ours, it was the developer's as the landowner. 
Okay, thanks for that, Alan. Um, okay, a couple of questions on commuted sums, which I think Liz and Alan, you both uh, mentioned. Liz, the question was in relation to how do you calculate those commuted sums when you're receiving the additional runoff, um, not just from the roads? Is that a document you refer to on SUDS maintenance or is it previous project experience? And similar really for you, Alan, but just in terms of what, how you do that for section 38 and section 278 SUDS works. Liz, do you want to go first? Yeah, so in terms of the £525, um, it was based on the, the cost that a water and sewerage company would charge for the discharge of surface water runoff. So we based it on that figure and it's the set figure that we use for all developments. Great, thanks for that. And Alan? Sorry, I'm just making a note of that one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, how you've how you've arrived at that one? Yeah, I, I've carried out analysis on some of the um, the likely uh, maintenance costs of things like the dynamic separators, and we have calculated out from the uh, potential silt loads and the disposal costs of those um, units the likely uh, ongoing maintenance discounted over a, usually a twenty year period at the moment. I think we're using. Um, so yeah, you know we have done. Um, analysis of that and where it's appropriate we do um, levy a commuted sum on the developer normally. Great okay thanks for that um, and then so a few specific rain garden questions for you Jamie so have you had any issues with road salts affecting plant growth in the rain garden or given any consideration to it? I think um, I went to a couple of presentations where well, road salts were causing issues for, for some plant growth. But actually, um, when we delivered our first few rain gardens, um, it was on a particularly busy road, which needed a lot of road salts for, um, during the winter time. And actually, the plant survived incredibly well. So I think it's really down to the types of plants that you do use. And it is incredible how hardy and resilient they are because of, of course they're also accepting quite polluted runoff and I know Joe was talking about all the heavy metals and the oils that get washed off into them they're incredibly hardy. Good thanks for that and then another yes. question sorry, sorry Joe. did you want I to add something? Just going to add a little note to say I was in a presentation recently about climate change impacts and they suggested that by 2040, we won't have sub-zero temperatures in the UK anyway. So road salt will cease to be um, a design problem. So mm. it's just worth throwing out there. Yeah, that's uh, quite a scary thought. Um, but I guess, as you mentioned, going for the drought tolerant um, plants generally tends to make them fairly hardy anyway. Um, and then in terms of the depth so when making a rain garden as deep as as possible when you're trying to avoid those utilities um ah maybe this is actually in relation to the freeboard uh do you face concerns over the rain garden becoming a trip hazard especially for low mobility or vision impaired users um and are there any features you can recommend to overcome those concerns I think when, when I do say 200 millimetres freeboard, a lot of people do kind of hold their breath and think, oh my gosh, it's a huge trip hazard. Um, but actually, if you are densely planting a rain garden, that is, and especially if it's, I think the question was specifically about visually impaired people, making mm. sure that they're not kind of walking into the rain garden and injuring themselves. But one thing to consider is kind of, you're always sloping the rain garden so make sure that the topsoil is sloped so um so the deepest bit is kind of bang in the middle of the rain garden not kind of at the outer edges of the rain garden and the other thing is to kind of really densely plant it so if a visually impaired person is kind of walking around he can kind of hit the plants with a stick and um and knows where they all are and, and also it's if there are kind of any blind or visually impaired users in the area you should know about um 
always kind of understand their journeys as well. Um, so you kind of try and avoid any any issues that they might encounter. Good. Hopefully those those tips help others to to get more rain gardens in. Um, I'll do another rain garden question and then move on to some of the others. Um, is there anything we've sort of talked about utilities a little bit and what the process might be for um, if the ones that are in the rain garden need to be maintained but what about doing anything to prevent new utilities going in and, and affecting how it operates yeah i think i said that um so the rain gardens are all kind of on a on a list of special engineering difficulties which our permit team have so um hopefully they've kind of got that all covered they they know where the rain gardens are they know the construction of the rain gardens and they can tell the utility company to either avoid it or um you know build it up to the specification if they, or if they feel that they can't they can contribute some money towards remediating it um i think there is kind of a huge like long-term um consideration especially at the moment where we've kind of got chaotic utilities going left right and center we've got virgin media we've got you know cctv we've got lamp columns um going up all over the place i think ideally some time in the future we should utility companies actually should come come together work collaboratively and do kind of utility corridors which we we always encourage for new developments especially large scale developments but um maybe one day in the future there'll be utility corridors so we all know where the utilities are and we're not umming and ahhing <laughs> about where they are and where we where we could suddenly hit a gas main or where we can suddenly hit a cctv column yeah sounds a lot easier to manage someone's um someone's mentioned ducts using ducts as well underneath the rain garden so you don't actually need to dig it up and have all the utilities in there which is obviously a, a similar kind of kind of thread um i think where where we said maybe bring up the gravel to the surface that might be a really good marker to to show the utility company where the actual services are within the mm. rain garden so they're not having to think too much about it um, well, yeah, yeah or dig dig the whole thing yeah alan did you did you want to ask jamie a question yeah just uh, just a very quick one i just uh, i didn't pick up on whether the rain gardens are designed as infiltration uh, systems so um whether they're kind of in in clay or gravel or or any type of um geology we do encourage some partial infiltration. So we never, ever line our rain gardens. Um, but we always make sure that if there are, isn't any much infiltration, actually nine times out of 10, there isn't much infiltration. They're always under drained or there's a, an overflow. So sometimes we'll have, we'll kind of build around a gully because a gully is a really good spot to start with um it's always usually the low point sometimes gullies aren't um but they're obviously not working if they're not in the low point but it's a really good um place to start when building a rain garden because you know where the low point is and you can kind of build around that um that gully and and save it as an overflow just in case the rain garden gets overwhelmed so there's always a mechanism um when we design rain gardens for it to drain so water is not sitting there or um, water can water can go somewhere yeah thank you very much for that uh, jamie because we're looking at putting some um tree pit uh, details in in one of our urban streets in the near future so we're, we're just uh, exploring that now and retrofitting uh suds within the urban environment brilliant great Sorry, there was one question that I don't think was answered. Um, it was specifically for me um, about the other features, the non-mechanical features that uh, Lancashire County Council would adopt. And yes, we will adopt a vast variety of other features, you know, from infiltration systems, basins, um, swales, grass strips, filter strips, um, Joe's favourite filter drains, if need be. 
you know, those are those are well within um, what we consider to be adoptable, provided they are the purpose is to drain the highway. Thanks, Alan. Um, okay, I wanted to come back to a comment um, on construction. So, Liz, you made a brief mention of construction um, suds. Can you elaborate on what is recommended as best practice guidance for the construction phase suds and whether there might be more focus on that in the future? This person, Rebecca, um, says, I work on major infrastructure projects and construction phase suds or always cause significant pollution, resulting in high non-compliance and adverse impacts on biodiversity. Contractors often get away with it. Okay, we, I only work with um, subs within development, so within residential development, so that question is probably more for large infrastructure, is it? Um, yes, major infrastructure projects, yes. Yeah, so probably something we'd need to get back to you on because it's not something that I would deal with under my area. But obviously anything, any development road would need to be in, in accordance with the Lincolnshire County Council Development Road Specification, which will cover those areas. So as long as it meets the spec, you shouldn't have any issues. But it doesn't really cover the type of infrastructure that's that the question is about. Can anyone else add anything there? I, th I think... Um... From my, from my experience, obviously, there are guidance, there's guidance out there now. Um, I think it is the Sylvia report um, that uh, deal, deals with construction of SUDs. And um, obviously, the, these are key issues, you know, where you, with any construction site, you will nearly always get a high level of um, silt generation, particularly in the runoff. And the surface water management plan for the site should cover those uh, details of how the um, the surface water runoff, particularly the contaminated runoff, is dealt with from the site and managed properly, Just not just for the pollution element, but for flood risk as well, because a number of greenfield sites I've seen stripped off, they've just run straight off into the back of people's houses when we had any heavy rain. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a serious issue for a flood risk and for pollution as well. Yeah. Go ahead, Jay. Just uh, somebody in one of the questions linked to this, somebody had said, I think it was Liz who showed an illustration of putting um, geotextile textile and stone in the bottom of a swale during construction phase to stop that buildup of sediment. And somebody in the questions has suggested that that's okay, but then that creates a plastic geotextile that needs to be disposed of um, at the end of that. And I, I, I hear that and I've, I've got my plastic pollution hat on, I agree. Um, but I've started to see an increased use of Hessian. And I wonder whether you could use Hessian and stone for the same effect and therefore you can reuse the stones certainly, and the Hessian can be can be um, disposed of sustainably at biodegrade. And also, I was talking recently to um, you know these coir sausages with Hessian wrap that you can get for sediment man management. I was talking to the manufacturer of those to see if they could make a sort of short fat sausage of coir and Hessian that you could put down gully pots during the construction phase to capture. Um, sediments and pollution during construction phase in devices like gully pots but also in devices like perhaps swales and, and inlets to basins and stuff i know there are some products on the mar market that use polystyrene but as you can imagine i'm not a great fan of polystyrene so i was um, looking for maybe a coir and hessian alternative but theoretically you could bury on site once it's contaminated because it would just be coir hessian and, sa and sediment um so if you were still in the construction phase and you had a, had a hole handy, I don't know about the waste legislation, don't shout at me, but though these were just sorts of solutions we were looking at for managing sediment during the construction phase to stop it from contaminating the suds during construction. Thanks for that, Joe. There, I know there were lots of questions we didn't get to, um, but we will endeavour to follow up afterwards. But I'd like to just come back to where we started the day thinking about suds and highways and are we nearly there yet um joe's reminded us at the very beginning of all those creatures we should be protecting from the nasty pollutants that can come from our highways and i think we've seen from today's um presenters that that we are nearly there with suds and highways 
um, in Lincolnshire, over 90% there, which is incredible. Um, but what they've done, what they've showed is it, it, it can be done. They've given lots of tips, links to documents, um, a few warnings to think about, um, and how they've actually overcome not just the reservations of people around them, but actually their own reservations um, in approaching SUDS, um, some of the real and perceived barriers that exist and um, how they've got around those as well. And I think the multiple benefits approach and, and making SUDS part of a bigger solution um, really came through for me. So down to us designers, approvers, developers, champions um, of SUDS to ask on the next highway project, why, why not include SUDS? Um, so thank you again, big thank you to Joe, Alan, Liz and Jamie, really valuable contributions. Hopefully everyone's taken something away from that. So thank you all. Um, we'll circulate the presentations where we've got consent, try and cover those additional questions and please do give your webinar feedback and complete the online survey which will be emailed to you sh shortly. Thanks again for your time and I'll hand back to Louise. Thanks Jessica for fantastic chairing today and thank you so much to all our speakers for really wonderful presentations. Um, I just want to say thanks again to the Sustrain partners and supporters for making the webinar happen and I hope everybody enjoyed it and found it interesting. I'll see you at the next webinar.